The man described as Europe's last dictator says he will step down, but only after a new constitution is written, and who knows how long that will take. For now, Alexander Lukashenko is still very much in power in Belarus, and that is not what the protesters want. This is Roundtable. Hello and welcome from me, David Foster. Today we talk to the investigator from the United Nations who alleges that the repressive capacities of law enforcement are used to silence any dissenting voice in Belarus. After four months of protests and pressure over a disputed election, a change from President Alexander Lukashenko. State media says he's promised to step down once a new constitution is in place. The demonstrations after the election have consistently denounced Lukashenko, with protesters calling for a rerun in a free and fair vote. We won't forget, we won't forgive has become one of the key slogans of the protesters, references to police brutality and other human rights abuses. The number of those arrested has reached so far more than 16,000. Reports from leaked police documents and human rights organizations reveal demonstrators have been subjected to brutal physical and psychological abuse. The European Union's already blacklisted Belarus's president, his son Viktor, and more than 40 of his security chiefs. Alexander Lukashenko has imposed counter sanctions against EU officials. But now that the president has signaled that his time may be limited after all, protesters are daring to hope that change is coming to Belarus. Very pleased to say that we can welcome to the programme Anes Mara, UN Special Rapporteur on Belarus. And Anes, I know you haven't been into the country uh, for around about two years, but you've talked to a lot of people there. You mention harassment, you mention threats quite usual in any kind of opposition campaign, but it's the phrase otherwise silenced that sounds the most sinister. What do you say is happening? Um, by silencing, I mean that uh, notably journalists are uh, being harassed um, and uh, somehow either forced to self-censorship or um, several of them have been detained. And we even have recorded cases of uh, criminal um, investigation launched against journalists just for being present um, in the places where peaceful protests are taking place. So just by doing their work, they are themselves subjected to um, detention and eventually also um, violence and totally unjustified uh, disproportionate use of violence on the part of the uh, anti-riot police who were square supposed this just to violence? the safety of journalists. Sorry, is this just violence on the streets, at the protests or in detention as well? From the records that we have, unfortunately, the violence is uh, taking place at all levels during the arrests, uh, during the transportation to uh, the uh, places of custody, and uh, of course, you're in, in detention. And we have uh, records of several types of uh, violence, both physical with uh, visible wounds. I'm sure you have seen some videos and testimonies, uh, but also moral in the sense that torture is widespread in um, uh, places of detention in, in Belarus especially for the past months and um, those who are detained for uh, expressing their views or for uh, their journalists who are accused of actually coordinating the, uh, the uh, peaceful protests are subjected to torture and ill treatment, including, uh, uh, well, moral harassment and, and intimidations. Is there any kind of due process, legitimate or otherwise, whereby those people detained are being brought before the courts. So the, I, I find quite cynical the fact that um, 
the, the there have been some uh, now 1,800 uh, cases of tortures uh, that have been documented, and uh, people have uh, tried to uh, to file a complaint for a criminal act against them, uh, but the um, uh, the uh, justice system in Belarus is such that it doesn't protect the victims of of uh, torture, for example. On the other hand, um, so so no case has been opened against the, the perpetrators of, of torture. Uh, on the other hand, several of the people who have been in detention and have been wounded or tortured uh, are themselves, upon exiting the detention center, uh, sub called again to the police to um, for and and uh, to answer for supposedly uh, crimes such as organizing mass riots or hooliganism or threatening public uh, um, order and national security. So that would be the harassment, perhaps. But I'm wondering if anybody has been given a prison sentence. Of course. Well, in the long term, several uh, uh, journalists, uh, lawyers, human rights defenders, opponents are uh, being targeted now by uh, criminal cases. Some of them are facing uh, up to five years in prison. And uh, the, the, the figures are, are quite hard to um, to follow up with because the situation, as you know, is, is evolving day by day. But I don't see it improving at all on the country. And the fact that there is... Um, a sense of impunity for the perpetrators of torture in particular, and I remind that torture from the uh, point of view of international human rights standards is an extremely serious crime. And these are not being prosecuted in the country. That is why I've been calling, like many other uh, others, uh, for an international independent investigation into these crimes. Uh, this was going to be my last question about an independent investigation. I shall bring it up now. What good will that do? Well, the victims have a right to redress, that is uh, for one. And uh, the most important from my perspective is that uh, the, the violence stops. And we have been calling uh, at several levels in the UN uh, for the authorities to engage on the road to dialogue and stop uh, stop this escalation of violence, liberate people who have been detained and who are still in prison for expressing their uh, political opinions. And uh, therefore, since we don't see any sign of any willingness to, to cooperate with international human rights protection mechanisms, um, we are hoping that uh, at the end of the day, some uh, move will, will take place uh, it depends whether it's with uh, under the aegis of the OSCE, eventually the UN Security Council, but uh, the international community, of course, must react to these crimes and hold the perpetrators accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Anais Mara. Now for part two of the programme, we welcome from Vilnius in Lithuania two of our guests. That's Franak Vyachorka, journalist and advisor to the opposition leader in 2020, presidential candidate Svetlana Sikanovskaya, also in that country, Katerina Shmatsina, fellow at the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies. And then we go to Budapest in Hungary, where we can see editor-in-chief of Visegrad Insight, Ocek Shabilsky. Uh, Frank, let me come to you first of all, since you're all in regular touch with Svetlana Sikanovskaya, and mention something that our previous guest said about holding the forces in Belarus to account. When you have an embattled president saying, I'm not going to give up, I won't kneel down, even if I'm alone, I will fight for what I have created, that is not going to happen anytime soon, is it? Uh, absolutely. Lukashenko doesn't want to give the power. He um, he was leading Belarus for 26 years, and he built the regime which is which was designed uh, to protect him and his regime. And right now, he understands that his time is over. He understands that he has to leave, but he doesn't want to be overthrown. So he is looking for the way out. But also, he still believes that he can win some more time with the use of terror, with the use of uh, force, with the use of army. And this is what we can see every Sunday when people are gathering for protests. We've seen his actions, we've seen his statements. There is no consistency there. He's very impulsive. On one, uh, one day, he's going to the KGB prison and meeting political prisoners and say it's a dialogue. The next day, he says that he says that they are terrorists and there is no dialogue with them. Uh, on one hand, he says that next week there will not be protest. And next week we see 30,000 on the streets and nobody disperse them. So basically he's uh, 
jumping from one idea to another idea. He's losing popular support. More and more people defect. More and more people join uh, Tikhanovsky's movement or uh, flee the country. And all are all these signs of the desperate, the desperacy of, of the of the government. Katerina, let me come to you because I, I noticed that you said that it's very difficult to gauge the level of support for the opposition leader uh, whom Franak is advising at the moment. Therefore, what is the state of the real opposition to Lukashenko uh, in Belarus? Is it the, just the protests on the street or are they getting behind one particular personal idea? Uh, first of all, it is hard to measure what is uh, the public opinion poll on the ground just simply uh, because the conduction of the public opinion polls is restricted and people like the pollsters are prosecuted. So there are some polls which are conducted uh, in Belarus, but uh, we just need to perceive them uh, with uh, with uh, some degree of uh, criticism, just to be like, cautious, not to exaggerate, over-exaggerate support for one political uh, leader. Um, but then again, uh, there is support for Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and for uh, the members of the Coordination Council, both uh, operate uh, from exile. And there is uh, this problem with the communication, given that they uh, have to work outside the country, address the people. This um, creates additional difficulties in how to connect with people on the ground. And we can see that um, the members of Coordination Council and Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, they reach out to local communities in Belarus. They try to schedule regular calls with uh, workers and uh, members of labor unions, etc. Uh, so there is still some, uh, like, th there is definitely support uh, among the population with uh, regards to the leaders of the opposition. But uh, in its nature, the street protest is little less, uh, also due to the fact that uh, anyone who claims himself or herself as a leader being in Belarus, they are in immediate danger and immediately uh, removed by security forces. OK, Vochi, let me ask you about something you wrote uh, back in August. You said there's clear, this is from Moscow's point of view, no, clearly no plan for Belarus yet. But let's not delude ourselves. The plan will be quickly established and implemented. It is now pretty much December. We're coming up to the end of the year. What is Moscow's position now? Well, uh, on the technical assistance, we see that um, whenever uh, the, the key elements of the Lukashenko infrastructure were in danger, like the uh, government TV, um, the, the people working there went on strike in, in, in summer. They were quickly replaced by, by people delivered from Moscow to, to support the, the official line of communication in TV and to, to keep Lukashenko TV running. There is a technical assistance that we can see from Moscow to sustain uh, the status quo, so to say, in, in waiting, uh, in waiting for, for something to change, perhaps. For, uh, for Lukashenko to find a new solution, new proposal. I, I'm here very much in line with what Franek said, that he, he is maybe he is not aware of that, but definitely he has his lack of options. He's cornered. Um, Moscow, however, is not uh, providing any solution so far. Uh, also, uh, we, we have seen some indicating polls or, um, well, what, what, what polls... Uh, uh, we could see online is, is then another question of, of their reliability, but the sentiments of Belarusians towards uh, Moscow uh, direction doesn't seem to be growing. Uh, they rather are on decline. So Moscow is trying to be careful about the next step. But, but perhaps Moscow is waiting to see who other than the main opposition leader, the people of Belarus, put their support behind as a replacement for Lukashenko, should it be deemed time for him to go according to the Kremlin? Well, uh, in, a, in a larger picture, in a larger game, if and we've, we could have seen this uh, in a couple of other countries around Russia, uh, it, the, the Moscow or Kremlin doesn't support uh, uh, you know, democratic revolutions, nowhere. But what it sometimes seeks to is to, is to make a, a leader of another country more dependent on, on Moscow through technical support, financial support, and then when the, when the moment is right to, to uh, install sort of a coup or, or replace him, uh, finding a, a new arrangement, new solution with a potential new leader. So from the point of, uh, of the big neighbor, that seems to be the logic. Whether it is possible to implement, uh, that very much depends on Belarusian 
nation, the Belarusian people. Yes, I'm going to move back to Franak now and um, put up on screen some words of Alexander Lukashenko. There's no smell of revolution here because there are no revolutionaries. The driving force behind these riots is an external factor. To what do you think he was referring when he said somebody or something from outside is pulling the strings here? Lukashenko himself, he cannot believe that ordinary people are priced against himself. He really uh, thought that perhaps it's Poland, perhaps Czech Republic, perhaps Netherlands, but not the people. He really believed he is the father of the nation, loved by everyone, but this is not true. And right now he's, he's blaming everyone. In the beginning, before election date, he was blaming Russia for organizing this revolution. After elections, he was blaming the West. Right now, he is uh, blaming everyone. He is uh, looking for uh, terrorist groups that are preparing for terror attacks against authorities and trying to destroy our nation. He also used the term the civil war, which is not the true, because what we can see, we can see the majority of uh, citizens united against the dictator uh, who usurped the power. Uh, but everything uh, that he's saying right now is not relevant because very often you know, his statements are emotional and they don't have really ground. And uh, his accusations, he often drops, for example, against Tikhanovsky, that Tikhanovsky killed uh, Roman Bandarenka, the young guy uh, actually killed by uh, law enforcement people or actually by, by Lukashenko's cronies. As, as we found out recently, uh, he accused Tikhanovsky that Tikhanovsky is going to bomb Belarus or asked to bomb Belarus. All, all these statements are, are weird and uh, uh, they appear somewhere in, in, in depth of his head. Let's take a look at um, a map showing the area and who's actually taken action against um, the Lukashenko regime. Katerina, I'll come to you in just a moment, but I'm going to go to Vojcik for this one. Uh, we've got the European Union imposing some sanctions. Uh, following that, we had North Macedonia, uh, then Montenegro and Ukraine. Uh, Vodcik, are any of these sanctions doing anything to, to frustrate Lukashenko's wish to hold on to power? No, I think he's impregnable to, to, foreign, uh, to foreign pressures in a form of sanctions. Uh, he is the man who lived off sanctions, of sanction re regime in the previous years. Uh, there are official sanctions, but there are also unofficial ways to go around them. And based on different smuggling, different gray zones, he and, uh, and his corrupt system could have uh, exploited that and funded uh, in, the pre in the previous years uh, his operations, including uh, you know schemes that are they're international. Only a coordinated effort of uh, of a number of countries uh, that are also bigger players uh, in uh, stakeholders in the in the Belarusian economy, and I mean extending much more beyond uh, beyond Europe, may have influence on the on the financial security insecurity of uh, Mr. Lukashenko and, uh, okay, and the people and that depending on his money. To, way, to a way I'm going to help to wrap up the program in a few minutes' time, which is how do we, or anybody, bring this to a peaceful conclusion. But, Katerina, let me ask you about um, what you describe as the increase, the inevitable increase in civil disobedience. We've heard about some strikes. Uh, unions are said to be getting more and more frustrated with what is going on. W what are the plans next? It depends on uh, whom you ask, and definitely, given the, the nature of this um, uh, like later less uh, dispersed uh, nature of the protests hard to predict what comes next and we definitely should ask the uh, maybe the representatives of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya office and uh, other opposition leaders what the further plans are but then I okay would, well we will uh, do right course, at this yeah. very moment we will do right at this very moment so Frenek what are the plans uh, to put pressure on the regime isolated cut him from any sources of funding through sanctions and other limitation and to inspire people on the ground because people need to feel the support sometimes emotional support from the west from europe from turkey from wherever in the world can play can play a big role will it end peacefully uh, absolutely, you know this. Uh, this is this. <laughs> it should be peaceful from the very beginning. This was a very, very peaceful uh, protest. Belarusians stick with nonviolent discipline, and this revolution uh, must finish peacefully. This is our hope. This is our goal, and we should make all possible to uh, keep this revolution nonviolent. So, Katerina Franak is saying there that um, there is some support 
behind the opposition, not just inside Belarus, but also outside? Is, is it sufficient to see um, the opposition triumph in this and Lukashenko to be sent packing? Uh, you mean uh, um, like what uh, the the opposition could do or the, the uh, foreign uh, leaders could do to support, like international community could support Belarus? Well, I suppose a bit of both. Uh, well, there is this much that uh, the international community can do for Belarus without interfering in the country. And I think uh, in that regard, we are doing well. I mean, the the representatives of Belarusian uh, national uh, like democratic movement in terms of reaching out to uh, European politicians, engaging uh, politicians across Atlantics and uh, international institutions, such as OEC calling for mediation and in general bringing attention to Belarusian agenda. Uh, but at the same time, a lot depends on the Belarusians, the protesters on the ground and the citizens of Belarus. And in this regard, of course, the protests are important. They send the, a strong signal to the regime that people do not obey the, uh, the authorities and that they won't continue sort of living as usual in this authoritarian environment. And then uh, even if the protesters do not uh, keep uh, showing up on the streets like every day or on a weekly basis, because, well, this is very tiring and uh, sort of dangerous commitment, uh, there are other uh, ways of nonviolent resistance, uh, such as like work to the rule uh, practices on the workplace and uh, other forms of nonviolent resistance that could be applied. And I think in general, the regime understands that they have lost control over the society and that the change is inevitable. Okay, so so let me come to um, Wojciech and, and ask you about this. It, it's not just civil disobedience. It's, it's not just perhaps the union saying we will withdraw our support, perhaps work to rule. It's also ex external factors such as uh, China pulling money out of the country that could put pressure on Lukashenko. Well, definitely, we see uh, a network of international connectivity that Lukashenko has been building, their exports of uh, products of the economy, not on, not to Europe only or not to Russia only, as uh, is quite stereotypical, but there are other partners. If you if you land in a Minsk airport in um, in Belarus, you immediately you're stroke, stroke, <laughs> stroken by um, three languages that are there. There is Russian, or there is English, but there is also Chinese. Uh, the presence of Chinese uh, as a long-term investment from, from China in this region is also through Belarus, uh, seeing, uh, seeing investment, money pulled out uh, for the time, for the period of uncertainty, uh, is, a, is a right direction, I would say. And it's a strong signal to the regime that things are not going the right direction. At the same time, there are also uh, investors from other parts of the world, uh, which are simply, they need to be uh, synchronized and and coordinated in an effort to, to end this standoff peacefully and with Mr. Lukashenko leaving. Uh, Frank, let me come back to you. Lukashenko talks about, with derision, the, the colour revolutions in other countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Perhaps this is going to be a social media revolution to, to some extent because of the popularity of um, your opposition leader's husband. I think his name is Sergei Tikhonovsky, YouTuber, blogger, and activists. How much of a role in support for the opposition is somebody such as that and the means by which he distributes um, his information going to play in bringing down Lukashenko potentially? Uh, you're absolutely right. Sergei Tikhanovsky uh, is a YouTube blogger who is in jail right now. And this revolution was enabled by technology. I never saw such technological revolution in the past. YouTube, Instagram, Telegram, all social media channels allowed people to communicate to each other, to create communities, to organize protests. Right now, all the Belarusian traditional media moved to Telegram messaging app and use Telegram for communicating, organizing uh, underground movement, resistance, boycotting state uh, uh, initiatives, everything on social media. And thanks to social media, people also managed to uh, secure and to, to stay anonymous, which complicated work for secret services. And YouTube, uh, which basically substituted state television, Lukashenko's propaganda channels, it allowed people to express their opinions, to create educational content. And people, uh, they basically created alternative infrastructure of the, of the government. Uh, they don't watch state television anymore. They create their mm. own YouTube channels where they educate each other, share opinions and discuss the future of the country.
That's 2020 and 2021 and the future. But let me ask you about something only perhaps 12 months in the future. Franak, I know you hope this will not be the case, but will we still be talking about this from the same point of view of Lukashenko being in power in November 2021? Oh, definitely not. Uh, I would say situation in the next uh, uh, months or two, we'll see how situation is developing. And we will understand, will will it end uh, this year or will it, <laughs> perhaps not this year, but perhaps we will get clarity this year or in the spring. I am sure that uh, before November 2021, new elections will be uh, scheduled and political parties will be competing and uh, presidential candidates will be trying to to get this position, but Lukashenko will be definitely out of out of game. Lukashenko doesn't have political will, future, and I think he 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 has like only uh, maximum six six nine months left. Well, listen, thank you each and every one of you for taking time to be with us on this edition of Roundtable. Your time and your knowledge much appreciated. Wherever you happen to be watching this Roundtable, we thank you too for taking the time. For me, David Foster, from the team, we hope to have you with us next time. Until then, goodbye.